Okay, <clears throat> I have 5.30. So I would like to convene uh, this meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for September 16, 2021. Um, can we have the roll call, please? Of course, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, President Mahood? Here. Vice President Henry? Here. Director Aikman? Here. Director Foltz? Here. And Director Smalley? Here. Thank you. Are there any additions and deletions to the closed session agenda? The staff has uh, no additions or deletions. Okay. Uh, let's see, this is the time for oral communications regarding items in the closed session, but I do not see any um, particip other uh, attendees other than the panelists. Um, so I think unless somewhere out there in the ether, shout out, but otherwise we'll, uh, we will go and adjourn this uh, meeting to um, reconvene in the closed session. Thank you. Kelsey, we'll see you back at 6.30. Thank you. Okay, I have 6.30. So I would like to convene this meeting of the Board of Directors of San Lorenzo Valley Water District for September 16, 2021. Um, there were no actions taken during the closed session and there is no report uh, from the closed session. Can I have the roll call, please? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. President Mahood? Here. Vice President Henry? Here. Director Ackman? Here. Director Fultz? Here. And Director Smalley. Here. Thank you. Okay. Are there any additions and deletions to the agenda? Staff has none, Chair. Uh, could I, uh, one issue, uh, Chair Mayhood, District Manager Rogers, I, I believe there was um, some concern about pulling the consent agenda minutes. Yeah, I, I was going to uh, say that we would pull the Board of Directors meeting minutes for September 2 because those were not actually included in the packet. What was accidentally included was the um, revised version of the July 15th one. So we're going to pull that issue from the uh, consent agenda and we'll look at the minutes of that September 2nd meeting at another time. Okay. Um, with that, um, we have uh, the time for oral communications. And um, let's see, this is where we have uh, communications from the public on any item within the purview of the district that is not on the agenda tonight. And let's see, do we have, I'm having a hard time showing, there we go. Um, I see that we have two attendees. Um, does anybody wanna uh, make a, a, a oral communication to the board at this time? Hearing none, seeing none, we'll go ahead uh, with the next item on the agenda which is director's reports. And I would like to first uh, turn to Bob for his report. Oh, well, thanks Gail, this will be very short. Um, unfortunately, we had a resignation from the admin committee, uh, Melissa Bounds, who's uh, served on the committee for I think almost two years, um, had to resign due to um, uh, work uh, issues, not being able to make the meetings on a regular routine basis. So we will, take up that vacancy at the next admin committee meeting uh, in October to uh, talk about, uh, excuse me, what we uh, would like to recommend to the board to do about it. Okay, that's fine. Um, and I would like to make an announcement um, just uh, after discussions um, with the district manager, uh, concerning the heavy workload that they have with uh, regard to CZU fire recovery and including a, a, a phone message today from FEMA saying that they're coming next week and they're going to camp out <laughs> um, at, in the district, which in some ways is good news, but it means it's really busy. Um, 
we've decided that we need to take a little bit of uh, pressure off the staff and we are going to cut back on the number of committee meetings. And rather than um, change the interval at which we meet, we'll continue to have the monthly meetings on the schedule because we know that that's a time when people can come. But if there's no issue that is really pressing or an issue in which a discussion of the committee members really adds value, um, we will be canceling those meetings. So I just want you to know that, um, you know, if you see the occasional canceling of meetings, that this is the reason we're trying to combine items into a smaller number of meetings to make them um, more efficient for both the staff and for that matter, for uh, the committee members time as well. Okay, with that, I would like to go to old business. Um, and the first item is the um, LAFCO webinar that many of us attended. Um, Rick? Hi, uh, and, and yes, uh, this uh, LAFCO webinar, the district council will present this uh, report to the board. Um. Okay, thanks, District Manager Rogers. This uh, this is not an action item for the board, but uh, rather a re report from um, the webinar that was hosted by the California Special Districts Association and um, the local LAFCO in August on August 11th. Uh, they conducted a Special Districts 101 webinar geared towards special districts, specifically within Santa Cruz County and their board and staff members to kind of go over the basics of uh, special district governance um, and cover topics that may be of interest to county special districts. A number of folks from San Lorenzo Valley Water District attended. Um, I, I didn't uh, make a note of, of everybody who was there, but I, I do recall that there were several staff members um, and uh, at, at least uh, one or two board members and some committee members as well who, who participated. And um, there was a lot of good information presented. Some of the, the key materials that were provided to the attendees are in the board packet for anybody who wants to look through them who, who wasn't able to attend the webinar. Um, but this is on the, the agenda um, in particular because there was a concept that came up um, during the webinar that resulted in some subsequent discussion within the district. And that is um, the idea that when a uh, board or for that matter, it could be a committee member requests information uh, related to a, an upcoming meeting um, from the district manager, that that information in, should be typically shared with all of the members um, so that all of them have the same information. Um, and so my understanding is that um, Rick is uh, inclined to implement a policy like that going forward, but wanted to put it on the agenda for uh, discussion by the board before making the change in terms of how the district uh, pushes out information to board and committee members. Okay. Um, are there any comments or questions from members of the board? To, to me, this seems like a very logical thing to do. Just make sure that everybody, you know, is kind of has the same information. We all come prepared um, for, for meetings. So I, I think it's a great, great idea. Um, yes, Jane. I uh, thank you. I uh, would echo that, and I think uh, I I know as a, a staff member uh, in a special district when I worked for um, the San Mateo County Transit District, um, that was that was also common practice that if we had a communication from a board member, we were expected to copy the rest of the board on our responses. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that's in line with best practices. Okay. All right. I think yes, go ahead, Bob. Yes, I, I, I completely agree. And um, I think this is something actually that was talked about perhaps um, a couple, three years ago. I, and so I'm glad to see that it uh, can get implemented. Um, I think there might be um, perhaps a need for um, just making sure there's no Brown Act issues associated with 
that kind of uh, uh, communication. I, I know that there there shouldn't be, but just to make sure that there isn't. That is a, that the board members know that there's not meant to be a back and forth between them as a result of the information being shared. Okay. And that, that's correct. District Council and I have had you know, deep discussion on, on, on how to implement this to make sure that you know when we pass this information on that we do it in a way that doesn't promote communications uh, between board members and so forth, strictly informational. Um, and uh, council and I will work on this moving forward. And we'll also, I think we'll go a couple of months or three months, whatever, you know, we don't, I don't get a lot of questions, but we do get questions, you know, like for instance, you know, how many people are on the, on the Lira program? and so forth and which that's good information for all board members uh, to have or about a specific leak or a water outage um you know you all get questions like that and then we'll bring this back to the board in, in a couple of months or so uh, to see how it's working out in an actual staff report to where we can uh, you could take action if you want to or further discussion did you want to follow up on your comments yes. Yes, please. Ultimately, I think this should go into the board policy manual as, okay. as an appropriate place to uh, to do that. So that sounds great, Rick. A good plan. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that was what David Aranda brought that up uh, on the, uh, he's a long-term CSDA, SDRMA board member, and uh, I think he dedicates himself to public outreach and to the process. Jamie. Um, I was just going to suggest that as a practice, um, one way that you can help to mitigate um, any possibility of crosstalk when you send a communication that goes to all of the board members is by blind copying all of us um, so that, you know, we're not inclined to hit reply all and, you know, then all of a sudden we're all in a conversation that we don't want to be in uh, because it wouldn't matter if we did hit reply all. So just a, just a thought around how we might be able to implement um, that in a way that prevents us from brown acts. Okay, any other comments or questions? Or are there any uh, comments from the um, attendees? Seeing none, hearing none, we'll go ahead and um, go on to new business. The first one, not a very happy one, is the Brookdale mainline leak. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Hood, uh, on, on September 3rd, um, early evening, um, the district, we had a report of a main break uh, on Huckleberry Island uh, in Brookdale. Um, the main line uh, in question was, uh, is the district's backbone main line, it's a 12 inch main that basically trans, uh, transmits water from one end of the San Lorenzo Valley to the other in, into Scotts Valley. It's, it's our most uh, critical infrastructure in distribution of, of water. Um, the main uh, experienced uh, a, a leak at a coupling um, right at the top of the embankment of the San Lorenzo River uh, uh, in back in Huckleberry Island. Uh, it's an underground river crossing that comes up. This is the third um, break that we've had at that same location within probably 30 feet. Uh, the first one was in 1982 when the 82 floods washed out a 20 foot section of Maine uh, from uh, runoff from the storm. Then about three years ago, a large fir tree fell uh, and damaged and broke the main line. And now uh, we've had this third break right at the top of the embankment on a 45 fitting. Uh, in the staff report, you'll see uh, photos. It's it's kind of hard to describe, but there's a photo where you can see that as the main comes up from the embankment, there's a, a definite deflection in the pipeline that uh, uh, goes down. And that deflection, in, in my opinion, and other folks, engineers that have looked at it, is that embankment is, is sloughing uh, at that location. Uh, there's also um, pylons that were installed when the railroad crossed there on a, on a railroad bridge. And you can see those pylon, pylons all leaning out outward, you know, indicating that, that the bank is sloughing uh, down. So staff uh, made a, a recredible 
response. Uh, you know, this was Friday night on a three day weekend. Several of the staff members were already on their way out of town. Uh, they returned. Um, we also um, called uh, the fire department in to help assist because this was in the back of Huckleberry Island, heavily wooded uh, brush area. <coughs> and we had to remove brush and it was dark, very dark out there. And, and so we uh, asked the fire departments to help us assist in, in installing emergency uh, lighting. So both Ben Lomond Fire and Boulder Creek Fire responded. Uh, and once we got down to the main, uh, it could have been a, a, a repair that couldn't have been made in a reasonable amount of time. But we were fortunate enough to have the, the repair type couplings and stores. Uh, we made the repairs in, a, in about eight hours. However, because of the deflection in pipe and, and the potential for that embankment to slough even further, um, it's a temporary repair. So our original thought was to go in and remove uh, 30 feet of pipe uh, and replace it with a welded pipe and, and beef up the pipeline. But that didn't address the embankment. The embankment is a pretty straight up and down uh, embankment from the top of the hill right down into the San Lorenzo River. We would have to stabilize that embankment with some type of retaining structure. Then now you're getting into the repairing corridor um, with some type of retaining structure, fishing game, First thing fishing game would ask you is what can you do to avoid working in the repairing corridor um, as an alternative project and, and replacing that uh, uh, pipeline would be a last resort in, in, in their eyes. Uh, the pipeline is about 50 years old. It was installed back in the early 70s. It is an underground river crossing that where it goes to, which we don't do underground river crossings because of environmental concerns. Uh, and um, the, uh, the ability to maintain and to monitor for leaks, uh, very, very problematic. Um, so we, we called out uh, uh, an, an engineering consultant um, that first Monday, uh, MEE, uh, who's done a lot of work for the district in the past, uh, two engineers from them, myself, we went back out, looked at it in the daylight and, and time to come up with a plan facilitate repairs. Uh, it was the general consensus uh, of the group that we need to do a bypass around that whole area. You know, we're not gonna go in and, and put in a, an extensive retaining wall system in the repairing corridor for a 50 year old pipe um, that we would eventually wanna get it out of the river anyhow. So we looked at doing a, a bypass. A bypass was possible, it's approximately 700 lineal feet and it would travel um, uh, from uh, the railroad right away to, uh, to the uh, local community access roads of the Huckleberry Island, uh, maintained by the Huckleberry Island uh, Homeowners Association. And they just replaced their, their bridge. Uh, their bridge was condemned. Um, it, was, uh, it had a lot of, uh, it was old and it reached its life expectancy. So there's a brand new support structure installed. Um, we're looking at uh, installing the bypass. It's about 700 lineal feet. It will remove the pipe from that embankment and from the under river crossing. The district does not have all the required easements to uh, install uh, through, the, home, uh, through the, the island, nor do we have easements to cross uh, the Huckleberry Island Bridge. Um, we have uh, met, District Council and myself have met with the Homeowners Association representative uh, uh, and their treasurer, their president and treasurer to talk about easements. They have been um, very open to the discussion of easements. However, there are some, some issues that need to be worked out on exactly who can give easements on the bridge. Um, they're not sure that uh, the Homeowners Association could give us an easement or not. Um, uh, the district council wants to add more to this when I get done. That would be great. Um, so she's working with them on uh, trying to come up with a way. There are ways of doing it. We just have some more hoops to jump through to uh, get this easement. So, you know, all in all, um, this is an extremely important water main. 
not only it's our backbone to move water, it moves surface water in the winter, it moves well water in the summer. It is the only feed into Boulder Creek. Um, we were we had some real concerns when we had to shut down. We figured we had about 48 hours of water storage to the downtown area of Boulder Creek before we would start uh, having a low pressure. So we went into a response mode and, and plus we deployed the large uh, neon or the large uh, LED changeable message signs out in the Boulder Creek area to conserve water um, until we got this pipeline back up online, which was only about you know, 12 hours. They weren't out there very long. Um, the repair went well. We also brought in uh, an outside contractor with a uh, track layer excavator because it was a very steep uh, uh, kind of crevice, that uh, drainage channel that this pipe was laid in. It's the old Southern Pacific Railroad right away. I think I, I uh, pulled a picture of that on the report. So to summarize, we're moving forward with design uh, of uh, the uh, bypass. We're moving forward with contacting Fish and Wildlife to make sure that there's no issues crossing the bridge. Uh, no, no, any permits will be needed to cross the San Lorenzo River on a bridge. I don't think so because we're out of the, the repairing corridor. We do have easements to obtain um, and we will, uh, originally I thought we would just move on this uh, with an emergency contract to do the 30 foot repair, but because of the project has grown and there's a significant uh, time in, in, in obtaining these easements, we'll be able to go out to formal bidding uh, for the pipeline. Um, we are issuing an emergency contract for the design uh, and to, uh, to be sure that the bridge is structurally uh, can handle the weight of the pipeline. We feel it can, but calculations need to be addressed and it needs to be uh, an analysis needs to be sure that uh, the 12 inch pipeline, uh, the bridge can support it, which we feel that there's no, no issues. The MME, the civil engineering uh, contractor is the same engineering firm that designed that bridge. So they, they have all drawings and they know all the, about the structural capabilities of that bridge. So that's one of that, that's a, that's a pretty good benefit moving forward. Um, we are getting out uh, a notice to the folks uh, on Huckleberry Island of what's happening. So people know because there's been a lot of, of activity down on the island with brush cutting, uh, surveying, locating. Uh, so we're trying to get ahead of questions of, of what we're doing, pretty much the staff report and a letter will be sent out to uh, all the homes within a stone's throw of this project. And uh, that's pretty much my report. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Most of uh, the information is in this staff report uh, with photos and be more than happy to answer any questions. Or if Gina would like to add anything into onto the obtaining of the easements. On that point, quickly, there's not a lot to add at this point. Um, after meeting with the Homeowners Association president and treasurer, uh, and the president being a lawyer who understands the landscape pretty well, um, they agreed to provide some information that will be helpful, but um, there's at least a couple of private parcels that are going to be crossed as well as the bridge, so there's some work to do to figure out how to get the rights that are needed. Any questions uh, for Rick from the board? Um, Lois. You're, you're, muted, you're muted, Lois. So what happens if we can't get the information? What, I mean, the permission uh, to cross that bridge or what are we gonna do? I'll ask Gina or council to answer if we can't get. Yeah, I, I'd suggest we cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, because, you know, there's there's a she number of tools in the toolbox and there's a number of ways uh, to do this, but um, we're just not there yet. Uh, Mark, did you have a something you wanted to say? Yes, uh, but first I have to say segue away to to Gina, uh, you deliver that with a deadpan face. Gina. 
and don't you know, believe that I didn't even realize? I <laughs> apparently you did not. Um, I I did a, a site walk with Rick and other members of the staff on earlier this week and uh, concurred with all of what he said as to the degree of difficulty of working in this area and was very surprised after looking at it um, that they were able to get this repaired as quickly as they did. So kudos to Rick, the staff, the fire department, and all others involved in getting this back online as quick as they did. Uh, this is, uh, and I agreed with Rick on trying to do any work in the slope or in the river itself. That's a that's a non-starter. That's that's not going to happen in any expeditious time frame. Um, and the slopes on both sides of the river are at least. 45 degrees, difficult to work in. Um, so Rick, if the, uh, but I do have a couple of questions on this. If the surface water sources in Boulder Creek are back and functioning again, um, are all areas adequately served if this line fails? You know, that, that is a, a, a really good question. And to answer that, it, first off, yes, if they're all, all the pipelines pre-CZU, depending on the time of right. the year, Mark, in the wintertime, yes, we're moving water from Boulder Creek down to Ben Lomond to let our, our wells rest. Mm -hmm. and it, when the surface sources are in, or even if they were in now, it probably would have uh, pushed that time frame out several days. Uh, and given us, you know, uh, we would have right. been under the clock, but we would have been able to, uh, to, to, to make it work. But having zero flow into Boulder Creek right now, a supplemental source, um, caused us some, some great concern. But in the wintertime, yes, you know, we have the capabilities and have moved water all the way to Scotts Valley surface water. Um, it just depends on the time of year. And I mean, we could do a little, you know, crystal balling. If that embankment was to fail, most likely it would be in the winter time. Um, uh, you know, full failure uh, from uh, from loading from water and so forth. But right now we have uh, zero water coming in. in the yes, area. but 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 the failure um, a week and a half ago was okay. not during the winter time. Uh, so the and I agreed that it's very likely that that slope is moving. Um, we walked on a portion of private property on the uh, Pacific Avenue side, uh, where you agreed that we were going to have to get easement from homeowner. Have you made any contacts with that individual yet? Not yet. Uh, right now, Mark, we're getting the surveying done to make sure where all properties are and whose property mm -hmm. we're looking at. We also have some of our own easements in that general area on private property from when uh, we installed the, that pipeline. So as soon as we get the surveys done and we know exactly where, whose property and where they are, um, that'll be our next step uh, to start knocking on some doors. Okay. Um, and I agree with with what you're, where you were leading with in the winter time, being able to move water south so that we can rest the wells um, is important given all that we've been discussing with the Santa Margarita Agency. Being able to rest wells is important, not just to our district, not just to cost impacts, but the overall basin um, in general. Um, last, I wanted to ask about um, in the memo that you put out to the board for this, um, you had uh, ballparked the cost. Um, and I did want you to go back and scratch your head and revisit that after the site walk that we had, because I, I think the consensus that we had out there is mm, that's probably not going to do it. You know, you're most likely you're right, and as I also stated in the report, at right now it wasn't. It isn't easy to estimate the cost at this time, but 
we can agree. take another look at it. I'll sit down with uh, Josh and the design engineer, um, and we can come up with some. It's probably going to be closer to double. Okay, and that's where my gut feel was. Also, it's probably going to be on the order of a half a million. Yeah. But just wanted to uh, make the rest of the board aware of that, since I was after the feel that of what Josh was saying could be as much as two hundred thousand just on that bridge crossing itself. Okay, that's all the comments I have. Thanks. Bob? Yes, thanks. And, and Mark, on, on that, I'd already broken out the calculator and did 700 times 600 and came up with a bigger number. So, okay. um, yeah, I think I think it's, it's regrettable. And Rick was talking earlier before the meeting started about how costs are just skyrocketing because of the demand uh, for rebuilding. And uh, I don't know that we're going to get out of that for a while. Um, Rick, my uh, uh, comments uh, first were to say, you know, thank you all for the response, which was fast and um, got us back online really quickly. Um, my concern going forward has more to do with the rest of the pipe. So as I understand it, the pipe is pretty much following the railroad, uh, the old railroad right of way. Um, both, both railroad and, and, and public uh, roadway. Right. Uh, are there other places um, along that are, you know, further north or further south that are potentially um, issues with a sloughing of the right of way or or what have you, or or is it all pretty stable uh, in either direction? And it was just this crossing that we right. had. Well, you know, not to get into, but there are other the river crossing in Boulder Creek, right below our office is one that's been problematic. And with the 236 pipeline and the CZU fire damage, we've taken another route now across the, the Loman Street Bridge on the San Lorenzo. Um, and we're engineering and surveying that as we speak. So we will get rid of that uh, river crossing as well. But you know, 50 year old river crossings and, and that are, uh, um, we need to, to be concerned and anytime we can get rid of an underwater river crossing because they you know sooner or later will become very problematic that uh we will have to uh you know consider that yeah but well, yes to answer your question yes okay yeah i mean this is um a great example of how the inventory the master plan was put together along with um some better estimating about um what kind of replacement we need plan we need to have for some of these old uh, facilities is going to be really helpful for the district going forward. Um, so thank you for uh, thank you for that information. That's all Jamie. Thanks. Um, so uh, you know, just thinking kind of globally about causes, um, is it you know when um when I worked in the water industry, I know that during droughts, uh, uh, we often saw additional stress on the pipes, either because of, you know, settling of the ground, causing, you know, pressure on the pipes, or because of, um, you know, the, the the pipes themselves began to, you know, leak because they, the pressure around them was changing. So, you know, is that a concern in terms of this incident? And are we seeing, um, do we see during droughts? Um, that we have additional, you know, uh, demand for maintenance and um, more problems, and how can we plan for that if that is the case? You know, and again, you know, you're right on, uh, Jamie. We are having a additional mainline leaks right now. Uh, as the, as we get further into the summer uh, and the ground dries, we are getting more and more. You know, staff is is barely keeping their head above water, um, repairing leaks. Um, and it is in a lot of the older pipe and it, it, uh, it is prone to leakage, the smaller pipe, the two inch, uh, it is prone to leakage and drought and dry ground, um, and, and probably Gail or uh, Mark can talk more about, uh, the movement of ground as it dries out, um, than I can, but yes, to answer your question, we are seeing more and, and we're just getting out and repairing. We, we try to uh, uh, apply a 24 hour rule from the time we find out that there's a leak to try to respond and make repairs, especially during drought. 
and, and, and that's even on the weekends because of uh, uh, because of drought and public perception of, you know, we're in a drought and we're letting water run. So we move right on leaks right away. And when we even if we go out and inspect a leak and, and size it up and do a, a triage, we'll place a barricade that says that this leak will be repaired within such and such a time. So we don't get repeated calls and people think we're just letting these, these leaks run. Um, but uh, if we do get more leaks during drought. And then any little earthquake will really increase the amount, especially during during drought. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the board? Um, I, I will go out, even though we're not voting on anything, I'll go out to the public just to see if there's any questions or comments um, from the attendees. If, if you do, please raise your hand. I don't see any. Um, all right, seeing none, and, hearing none, then we'll go on to- And you know, just uh, one, uh, you know, fun, one final comment. We did try to get <laughs> you know, social media updated as soon as possible. I, I pulled the uh, staff in, uh, Carly was on vacation and we pulled her in to update social media. And this also warranted a late evening phone call to to the board, um, which uh, I don't like uh, calling too late, but I'd rather have you hear this from me from, than uh, from the general public. Call any time about this. No, I, I, I appreciate it, especially when it's something that major. I mean, my immediate thought was not just that this was leaking, but that potentially given we're in the middle of a fire season, we were in the middle of a dry lightning thing. It's just, this is, this is really serious. So I, I, I was glad that you gave us a heads up. Okay, let's move on to um, the next item of business, which is boardroom facilities for hybrid meetings. Uh, I'll kick this off. Uh, I even thought about you know pulling this item because when I placed this item on the agenda, it was because of we were looking at a October 1st return to in-person meetings. Um, I apologize that we didn't get a better staff report, but we're still collecting and still are collecting information. But I think uh, district council will kick this off and give a segue in and then I'll pick up after where she leaves off on the rest of the report. Thank you. Yeah, the, the reason that I was asked to comment on this item is because there have been um, legal changes that have changed the urgency, as Rick mentioned, of this item. Um, the first one is that we got a new governor's executive order um, that extends the prior executive order. Uh, we're just getting these, these executive orders that give us a few more months at a time to be able to conduct remote meetings uh, where the Brown Act rules are suspended that otherwise would require board and committee members um, if they are participating remotely to post an agenda at their location. Um, Uh-oh, you froze, Gina. Some of our board members here haven't been, um, haven't actually dealt with pre-pandemic uh, board meetings. And so you may not have had to deal with this before, but it was the case before we got these um, governor's orders related to COVID that if you were traveling for a board meeting, a quorum still had to be present within the district and the traveling board member this location had to be published on the agenda. It had to be posted at the location where the member's traveling, like I said, and then the, open, the location open to the public. So we don't have to do that now because of these governor's executive orders. Um, the latest one extends the time to do remote meetings through the end of this year. Um, and then in addition to that, there's new legislation that the governor just signed this week, um, AB 361, that allows the district to continue to conduct remote meetings potentially through the beginning of 2024, as long as certain conditions are met. And those include the board having to, they include, they're continuing to be a state of emergency or recommendations for social distancing by local public health authorities and the district every 30 days considering whether those conditions still exist 
and um, making findings to that effect. So as it stands right now, remote meetings are fine through the end of the year. And then after that, it depends on how long the state of emergency or social, uh, social distancing measures continue. And the board does have to consider these issues um, every month as to whether to continue meeting remotely. Um, and then these provisions would expire in 2024 and we'd be back to the, the regular Brown Act scheme, which requires a quorum to be physically present within the district and posting of agendas at remote locations, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to provide that update because it changes, uh, like I said, the urgency with which the district is addressing the issues of what to do uh, in terms of coming, uh, returning to physical meetings or hybrid meetings. Um, and um, with that, I'll turn it back to Rick. Thank you, Gina. And the direction that you know staff is is moving is uh, is to have you know hybrid meetings to where we can continue with video conferencing. Um, the general public can participate um, in our meetings. You know, we do have a lot of absentee uh, customers who own uh, and have have, or have a uh, service with us, but you know don't live in the area. They live all over. Um, and we do think that folks, you know, who have to drive to meetings and, uh, and on a stormy night or, uh, you know, in the dark would, would rather prefer from the, from the comfort of their home than to drive to a meeting. Um, so we think it's important that we continue with uh, a hybrid meeting, but also obviously we have to uh, comply with, with Brown Act. So staff has been out looking at facilities that are available. One of the issues by going to hybrid is that we will need some, some sophisticated equipment, monitors, uh, cameras, sound system, uh, and, and some uh, um, interface with uh, the internet. And we're pricing that now, and that's anywhere from uh, three to, to $6,000 for that equipment. That equipment is not portable. It's highly recommended that you know it's uh, bolted to the ceiling uh, or to walls, et cetera. Um, we're, we're looking, you know, obviously the district just can't have its meetings anywhere. We have been using uh, uh, our operations building uh, main training uh, staff room, lunchroom, kind of small to put monitors on the wall to cover windows and cover mapping where mapping is at. Uh, you don't have much distance between folks. It's very tight for the amount of people we do get. You know, obviously we think we'll have less participants in the audience if we have hybrid meetings, but still, still people like to go to meetings, and and would and most likely there be a, a few that will attend. The operations building is just a little too small, so we're looking. Um, we've been looking at other available um, meeting type structures. Um, the library in Felton is being looked at. They're just coming back from COVID restrictions. They just got all their information reposted to the website this week. I've had phone calls uh, and we're still collecting information on that facility. It's, it is a likable facility because you know it meets district needs as ADA, size, lighting, parking, um, but not sure that it meets uh, a big portion of our needs we're having to set up, take down the amount of time uh, that uh, we need and the amount of meetings. Um, it is geared towards uh, uh, the public sector as well as, as uh, other groups. So we're still uh, obtaining information to see what the flexibility of that facility is. Um, we're also talking uh, with other uh, locations uh, in Boulder Creek, uh, I met with the Odd Fellows people and toured their facility to see what uh, what they have to offer. You know, the big concern is uh, the equipment and to be able to you know use the facility when we need to be. The Felton Community Hall, for instance, has a lot of restrictions. I've never been easy to work with the, those folks because of the amount of people that use the room. Senior centers have a lot of conflicting uh, activity at the senior center. So uh, we're also looking at the uh, office space that we own at the Johnson building. There's an appeal to that because then staff could use it at any time for training. Um, video conferencing is here to stay. 
Um, as far as I'm concerned, as a manager, that staff uh, uh, staff time to be driving and traveling is an expense that we don't need. And if we can do training, you know, in a in a group setting uh, with video conferencing, we're money ahead. Um, and so I I think uh, that type of setup. Uh, will be used uh, more than just board meetings uh, and and committee meetings. Um, so we're still putting together, uh, and I hope to bring back, uh, the admin committee had this same uh, topic, and I thought we had a, a great discussion at the admin committee. A matter of fact, one of the members uh, made a comment and said that if, if we didn't have video conferencing, she could not be on the committee. She just doesn't, didn't have the time that she could take away from her work. Um, so we we need to put together a, a more detailed staff report. We need to collect more information from the facilities are available, and we need to get this back to the board. Um, I did rush this to you just in, you know, looking at October 1st, that would have been the first uh, board meeting in October. We would have had to be, uh, you know, back in building uh, as we were going. And uh, the word was the governor was or thinking of changing but I couldn't take that chance to tell you that, hey, we can't have a meeting uh, without having it back at the, the ops room uh, and probably no uh, video conferencing. As you know, individual laptops don't work well in Zoom meetings or whatever when you're sitting side by side. There's a lot of feedback issues. I'm sure that that may be able to be worked out. But with the Zoom, we're looking at Zoom rooms. Scotts Valley is moving to Zoom room proprietary um, the, the, what we're uh, the platform we're using tonight, but it has a lot of uh, unique features that are good for for the types of meetings we hold. So um, we're moving in that direction, and we'll come back to you uh, to the board and to first we'll go back to admin committee um, with a, a more detailed report, and then back to the full board. Uh, the urgency, as Gina, as council uh, stated, you know the urgency uh, to be back. Uh, has been uh, removed with the governor's orders and hopefully you know we can have an uh, agenda item once a month the states that we want to continue this and take advantage of uh, the long uh, the long time frame and with that I'll turn it back over to the board and I'm not looking for any direction or uh, anything from the board tonight but I'll definitely take input are there any questions or comments from the board Uh, go ahead, Mark. Rick, any uh, estimates or guesses on what the cost impacts would be for this uh, Johnson Building renovation? Um, how long that might take? Uh, yeah, uh, Mark, I'll put that together. You know, we're probably estimating anywhere from fifteen to to twenty thousand with the equipment. You know, paint, okay. clean up. You know, uh, maybe we may have to do something to ventilation. Um, you know, we have to look at all that and to make sure, you know, one of the, the, the areas too is that we got to look to make sure that there's no use permit requirements. You know, I don't want to uh, remodel a room, it, but it's basically cosmetic, 15 to mm -hmm. 20. Okay. That, that's reasonable. And, and, and if it provides the district the flexibility to use this for things other than the board meetings, other than committee meetings, Staff right. training and other aspects. Then, the one thing I want to be uh, make sure of full transparency to the board is, you know, the Johnson Building. Uh, you know, we're going to be making the, a determination, uh, hopefully in the next year, whether to remodel that as our new headquarters, or to move somewhere else, or to do nothing. And mm -hmm. so, I'm looking at probably a window of three years uh, before, if say we were going to remodel, we would have to vacate or if we sell it maybe even sooner. But I was kind of estimating a three-year window that we could probably use that room. Lois? Yes. You're muted. Uh, at one time we were having uh, committee meetings in the Johnson building. That was in 2019, I think. Uh, but Here's part of the problem here. I think having a hybrid uh, where we get a choice because 
I've been out of power so much lately that I worry every meeting we have that I will have to go elsewhere to be able to attend the meeting. Whereas I would assume if it's hybrid, I could go to the, if I have no power, I could go to the Johnson building. And uh, if I'm wrong on that, uh, please tell me because uh, that's what I would have to do, even though driving at night isn't my favorite thing to do. That would be correct, uh, Director Henry. You know, uh, and some of the board has uh, has indicated they'd like to be back in person. And you know, I, I think in person meetings definitely a, a lot more personable, and you feel more connected to your customers. But I don't, you know, it's going to be a learning curve to see how many customers want to come to an in person meeting. Bob? Yeah, just a, a couple things, just to reiterate what, what uh, Rick said about the admin committee meeting. It was a very good discussion and we are looking forward to having it back for uh, further consideration. I did wanna make a couple of comments um, about uh, Rick's uh, thought process as input, Rick. Um, I don't think it's a uh, either or decision here regarding how you think about equipping the district for video conferencing. Um, uh, Zoom supports multiple uh, systems that scale from small to larger type uh, rooms. And so um, it could be, for example, that you would go ahead and put a medium sized system in the, in the operations you know, training lunchroom and, and have a separate system in, in another area doing different things set up for different kinds of um, meetings. Obviously the bigger one would be potentially for uh, board meetings and potentially other larger meetings that you might have internally. Um, the, the second part of it is I would also, uh, it, um, and, and I can provide some input on the equipment uh, offline, but I do have some input on the equipment given I spend a little bit of time in this area uh, from a technology point of view. Um, sorry, but I've done VoIP a lot. Um, so please, please take that into consideration when you're when you're thinking about where to locate this. I, I don't think it's an either or situation. Okay, uh, Mark, I think you had your hand up. Or again, no. Okay. Any other comments by members of the board? Um, if not, let me go out to the public and see if they have any questions or comments. Are there, uh, Cynthia? Good evening. Thank Good you evening. for the discussion. Uh, personally, I appreciate being able to attend from home. Something happened to my screen. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I appreciate that because I don't like to drive at night and being able to listen in is really helpful for me to understand what's going on with the district. So um, I appreciate that you're examining all those possibilities. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comment. Any other comments or questions from the public? Okay, Here, seeing none, hearing none, um, we will go on to the next item on the agenda. Um, we already pulled the one thing that was on the consent agenda. Um, so next we have uh, district reports. Are there any questions or, or comments um, on the district, uh, the department or committee reports? Bob? Yes, thank you. Um, I, had, um, I had a question about the well reports, uh, Rick, and I was, I was hoping that maybe we, we could go through the well reports in a little bit um, more detail to make sure that we're understanding, reading them correctly, and make sure we understand what the status is. Given the drought situation we're in and the surface water sources are offline, I, I, I would like to make sure I'm reading the well reports properly and understanding what the trend lines mean. Is 
that is that possible, or should well, we do that? What, what would you like to make? I, you know, I'm I, 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 I'm not quite sure. I mean, do you want? You know, I, I can talk to you and and tell you, you know, what, you know, what these lines are. Uh, you know, one's a dynamic level, and they should be somewhat pretty self-explanatory, except. Uh, there is a green line that I don't know about where that's where the pump is set in, in the well. Uh, okay. The screen locations are on the well. Obviously, that's where your water you know, comes into. Uh, and as you can see, some of these wells are, um, you know, are they're going, you know, I, what I look at is I look at the dynamic level uh, to see where our pumping water levels are. And, uh, and I also will talk with field staff when, when I review pump data to find out what type of operational problems are they having? Are they having to shut down because of air or, you know, are there any pump cavitation or anything? You know, and when I look at this, I look at, at the wells that are doing pretty well um, for uh, this time of year. I mean, I don't see anything that, of course, I'd like to see obviously water levels coming up. You know, some of the water levels are going down but a lot of this is pretty typical for this time of year. Um, so, for, so for example, on Quail Well 5A, which is showing a dynamic level at about the screen location. So what would be the danger point um, for these uh, pumps and wells? The danger point is when you start getting into the screen areas. Okay. You're starting to get, that's when you start getting some a pump cavitation. And that's why we use a uh, variable frequency drive uh, controller. So when you start getting down to levels like this, the, the, the controller actually dials back the flows to get these water levels. There's sensors uh, that, that, that sense the water level in the well. And as it, as, the, as it pulls down, the pump throttles back or throttles up. When, like when a pump first turns on, it pretty much pumps at capacity until that uh, dynamic and static water level start to drop. And then the pump will dial back so it doesn't over pump and break suction or give you the cavitation. You know, definitely that what's the big concern here is going into our winter months, we do have Foreman Creek uh, back in service. So we'll be able to get back on the surface water, but we need to get the rest of our surface sources back online. You know, I, I'm thinking that, you know, when we look at things like this, that, you know, we can, we can handle two to three years of hard drought. Um, but after we start getting into the third year, uh, we need that surface water back. And I'm, confident that we can get pea vine back within the next year and a half to two years and then the others will follow in three to five um, Rick, on the on the um uh, regarding that uh, though are we still taking water out of fall creek because i know for a for a, a period of time that we were pumping water from uh, fall creek felton area up to boulder creek in order to compensate for the fact our surface water sources were offline the numbers still look like for August that we're still taking water out of Fall Creek. For, for the month of August, we were, but as we hit September, we got down to uh, the bypass requirements. So we are no longer moving water from Felton up to uh, the North system. And that was a, a, a real positive and, you know, that's helped quite a bit. As you saw, we take, we took some significant water oh, out yeah. of Fall Creek without oh, yeah. jeopardizing you know, the Fall Creek bypass flows. Right, right, okay. Um, just a, a question on the engineering report. Um, is there an update for the Felton Heights tank and the, um, I forget the name of the tank for the property that we purchased from Nick Nakari? The, the Redwood Park tank. We, Redwood changed, Park. Uh, we finally got rid of the name Swim Tank and took it to Redwood Park tank. Thank, thank you. The obvious thank reason. You. Uh, the Felton Heights tank, uh, um, uh, our legal department has uh, done review. It's back to um, uh, the homeowner. Uh, and now he has sent it out. I've uh, had conversation or email conversations. I've been hitting him up once a week. His, uh, his counsel, his attorney are reviewing uh, uh, the, uh, the easement uh, information and the, the side agreement um, that about fencing and different things that we'll do uh, on the easement. 
the Redwood Park tank surveyors should be out surveying the pipeline and the pipeline will go off first and then the tank will be constructed. So I, I would say the tank will be actually constructed uh, next calendar year uh, and hopefully the pipeline will still go in uh, uh, this, this, fiscal year, this fiscal year. Would the Felton Heights tank go in this, this fiscal very, year? Very, excuse me, very similar. The only thing we don't have, we have survey done, we have uh, geotech done. The only thing we don't have on Felton Heights would be uh, um, envir uh, environmental uh, CEQA review, uh, just because I don't want to spend money until we actually have uh, the easements obtained. Would, would that be a negative mitigation? Yes. Yeah, we see no issues there. Be very similar to, although I thought that with uh, with the Redwood Park tank, but as you know, we got a lot of comments, but you know that didn't stop stall the project or anything. And I don't anticipate the traffic issue as we did with Redwood Park. Okay, good. And then the last thing was on. Just wanted to point out for folks that the on the finance report, we're still holding steady on our accounts. Um, that are in arrears. Uh, so we're not we're not seeing a lot of movement either way. So that's at least we're not getting worse. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. And we still are working on getting re, uh, reimbursement from uh, the state. Yeah, and that, and that would be great if that could happen. Okay, thank you, Rick. Right. Mark? Yes, um, regarding the water master plan, um, Bob, I believe it was, uh, you alluded to it earlier, having the uh, fittings in place for that repair, uh, something that we were able to identify from the master plan uh, is one benefit to having that master plan in place. Um, yes. And uh, I just wanted to reemphasize that uh, as to the benefits to us having that master plan. That's um, why I voted for it. <laughs> and there are a couple of uh, comments in the engineering report as to other benefits that the master plan is providing. And there's some mention of the possibility of elimination of booster pumps. Uh, is that, uh, Rick, is that uh, cost savings? If we're no, able to and, you know, we've identified this back, yes, when we, you know, we ran some scenarios already with this master plan. We kind of, you know, we had these assumptions, but we didn't have the engineering data. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. so we get rid of some of the hydraulic restrictions we have from undersized piping and change some of the zones around. There's the potential to get rid of two or three of the smaller uh, zones, such as Blackstone booster, Bear Creek Estates booster, um, you know, because we're changing the hydraulics and the pressure. Right. Uh, and uh, yes, there there are uh, that potential. And and I'm interpreting from that cost savings. Yes. Okay. Very much so. That's that's what I wanted to emphasize: cost yeah. savings benefit from the uh, results of the master plan. So spending right. the money on the master plan. Yes. And you know we're we're also you know running fire flows now. A lot of this replacement, uh, home replacement, CZU fire home replacement, and the fire districts have tightened up their requirements now before they kind of let remodeling and so forth uh, not uh, you know, provide fire flow calculations. They're being adamant now. And so that's just trickling down to us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Lois? Yeah, I don't know if anybody can answer this, but I usually look at the bill pay and I noticed that there were three refund checks uh, to one, a name of just one person and they amounted to over 4,200 and some dollars. And I, I'm just kind of curious um, and I don't need an answer right now, but I, I don't even know if you can give me an answer right now. I, I should have asked sooner, but life's been a little out of control. It was three refunds to, uh, one person. person. Okay. We, we can, that's pretty much something we can, we can look at, um, and get an answer for you, uh, Lois, no problem. Okay. 
Bob, did you have a, a question on the finance report about how we were accounting for CZU um, that you wanted to ask in your email that you sent earlier tonight? That you didn't see us accounting for it on the yeah, th balance? Th that, thank you for the fill-in on that while I was desperately trying to click the, the mute <laughs> button with my, with my mouse. Um, I, I think we can probably take that one offline. I think it's probably more of a, I think it's more of a presentation thing than a numbers thing. And that, 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 so we don't have to cover it here. No problem. But thank, but thank you for asking. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Lois, you still got your hand up. Do you have another question? Um, no. Okay. I, I just am not used to using my hand. Okay. How about, um, do we have any questions or comments from um, members of the public? Um, I don't see any, um, hear any. So uh, given that, um, I think we've reached the end of our agenda. And um, unless there's an objection, I will um, adjourn this meeting. Okay. Thank you all for attending. Good night, everyone. This has to be a record. <laughs> well, I don't know. Close. Close. Good night, all. Good night.